we want to spend this period, the first hour or some reasonable part of it, uh, talking about the philosophy of human nature. Um, we'll do this for an hour and then we'll enjoy ourselves with a test for whatever, <laughs> however long that takes. Um, and I want to start out by saying I think the chapter on the philosophy of human nature in our book is the least compelling chapter that we've read. Okay? I think that it, it, it proceeds into arguments that are almost absurdities. Um, so I'll just warn you up front, and a couple things I'm going to say today are my conclusions, my own philosophical conclusions, to cut through some of that stuff, okay? Um, I mean, when they, when they got into, into discussions about um, what constitutes the, well, the, the, mind, the mind dualism question, um, some of their reasons about what constitutes, you know, being the same person, I really do think I'm certain. Okay. Philosophy, besides being the philosophical you know, wisdom, love of wisdom, the attempt to think rationally and critically about life's most important questions in order to obtain knowledge and wisdom about them. That's what we're talking about. So let's talk about one of the most important, and in fact, one of the ones that, that uh, I'm not going to get into this, but by extension, one of the ones that probably has the most practical impact on our culture is what do we, is the philosophy of human nature. What does it mean to be human? What am I? Um, this, we get into questions, you know, the abortion issue is related to that. Um, and the issue of the penal system, how do we treat people, to what extent are people responsible for their own actions. You know, there's huge ramifications from this, which is why I was a little sad that this chapter I don't think was as good as some of the others we've read. So, Perhaps the most basic questions regarding human nature are, what makes us human? Well, how are we fundamentally different than my dog? Or, you know, the tree? Um, and what gives each of us our distinctive personalities? How is it that, that Ross, as a human person, is different than Chris as a human person? Now, what are those things that both make us human and also make us different? I will say, because we're only going to spend the next, you know, 50 minutes or so talking about this. If you're really interested in this topic, we've dealt with it in much more detail and much more um, content in our systematic theology course. Because the theology of human nature is, we get into a lot more of that because we talked about the nature of the human soul, we talked about dichotomous and trichotomous definitions of humans. Dichotomous is the view that human beings are of two parts, you know, our body and our soul or spirit. The trichotomous identifies that the soul and spirit are not the same thing. Um, I tend toward the trichotomous because it helps me understand, you know, the nature of um, um, animals. You know, my dog has a personality. My, there is something about my dog that that is different than every other dog, at least that I've ever met. You know, there's something going on behind those brown eyes, and yet I don't believe he has a soul. So the idea that there is besides the physical body, that there may be two different aspects to us, one of which is the part of us that is able to relate to God, the other part is the part that has um, personality, in a way that a tree doesn't have a personality. Okay. Um, if you want to find out more about that, you can go to the videos that we have from our systematic theology class, and identify that when we did the philosophy or the theology of, uh, of humanity. Okay. So. Another way to ask the question is, what makes me me? What makes me human first, and then what makes me distinct from other humans? There are two fundamental approaches to this, and you will probably have realized if, when you read the chapter, um, that these two fundamental approaches are the same basic fundamental approaches that people take in metaphysics, in terms of how they understand the nature of reality overall. First is the mind-body dualism. Remember, dualism was one of the, one of the basic metaphysical ideas that there is, in this case, since we're talking about humans, human nature, that there are two distinct aspects or parts to humans. There's our physical body, but then there is our immaterial, non-physical selves, or souls. And that may be in two parts, like I say, souls and spirits, and people disagree on that, and that's okay, because someday we're going to find out. Um, but the idea that there is some non-concrete, spiritual aspect to us. When we talk about People, we talk about that as the mind-body dualism. Mind and spirit or mind and soul here is being referred to synonymously. 
Um, and again, completely consistent with the dualistic view of the nature of reality. The second view is physicalism, which in terms of a metaphysical view would be exactly parallel to materialism. Again, metaphysics, there's dualism and materialism. Exactly parallel to that in the nature of humanity or human nature, we have the mind-body dualism and physicalism. Now, physicalism proposes that everything, including even the human consciousness, our minds, etc., can be fully described in terms of physics and physical pro uh, processes. Again, based upon philosophical materialism. There is nothing that is real that you can't see, hear, knock on, taste, you know, be aware of physically. So, in metaphysics they say no souls, no angels, no God, no spirits, no ghosts, no anything. And, and we talked about already in this class, of course, why we run into problems with that. Because by definition that means you have nothing abstract, nothing that's non-concrete. So where do the numbers fit in that? Okay, numbers are an abstract form that's more than just I have this many apples and we call it three. You get into negative numbers, you get into, you know, abstract sets of numbers. There's no room for that in pure materialism. Okay? So, these are the two ways we have, philosophically, of thinking about human nature. Am I just a body and everything is explicable in terms of, of some physical process? Or is there some part of me that is not physical? Got it? Now, let's talk first about mind-body dualism. One of the first major philosophers to argue this, the father of modern philosophy, was Descartes, and he argued for mind-body dualism. And his primary argument was that the mind and the body have very different characteristics, very different properties. Our minds don't act the same way our bodies do. He argued, for instance, that the body is divisible. We talk about parts of our body, as our book says, you know, uh, body parts. Nobody talks about mind parts, you know, parts of our mind that the mind is indivisible, the body is divisible. Now, in more recent times, one of the arguments against that is to say, well, we have schizophrenic people with multiple personalities, which is a kind of division of the mind. And so there are some arguments against that. Descartes' arguments, while he sort of started the thinking process, are not the compelling ones anymore for mind-body dualism. He also talked about the fact that the mind and the body are different in that everything you do in the body, if there's somebody there to observe it, should be observable. Whereas there are private parts to your mind. There are aspects of self-awareness and of thoughtfulness that nobody else is privy to but you. And does that not define it as being a fundamentally different kind of thing? Well, the radical materialists or physicalists, when we talk about human nature, would say, if they could see inside your brain, then they would see chemical processes going on. Right, so they argue against that. So, we have to recognize, well, Descartes started the process, and we have to give him a nod. His arguments are not the most compelling ones anymore. But we do have several other arguments in favor of mind-body dualism. The first one is the argument from subjectivity. This says that the human mind has a sense of I, of me, being a subjective being. And by the way, none of this stuff is on the test. This is, I think I told you in case anybody wasn't worried. I think I told you that um, the test was going to go, go through the fifth week, which is the job that was enough. Okay. Um, I can perceive that I have a self-awareness, and I can perceive that other cognitive creatures, other thinking creatures, have their own version of self-awareness, even if they're not people. You will remember in the book they talked about a groundbreaking article that was written is what, what would it be like to be a bat? Well, by asking that question, that philosopher, it was written by a philosopher, not a naturalist, that philosopher was saying, the bat has some perception of what it means to be a bat. He's got some cognitive awareness. He makes decisions, you know, that I think I'm going to find something to eat. Or I think I'm going to fly over there and poop on that yellow wall across his house, which they do a lot. <laughs> and so there is some sense in which there is a cognitive awareness in every animate creature. That I mean every moving, you know, not, not trees, not plants, but every mammal, every, every um, um, animal. And yet none of those characteristics exist in non-cognitive beings. You know, we don't have a sense, we don't perceive a sense that that tree has a, a, a self-awareness some down deep inside of, of treeness, that he is a tree. 
And yet all cognitive beings, we have some sense of that. We can put ourselves in the, in the mindset of understanding what would it be like to be a bat, okay? Um, so that's one argument which suggests that, that our mind is fundamentally something different than just physical processes because we can conceive of the cognitive self-awareness of other thinking creatures, all right? I, I don't expect that to change your life, but it is one of the arguments for it, okay? A second argument is the argument from qualia. Qualia is a good word for you to know. Qualia means the properties of, or characteristics that we perceive in other things. The redness of an apple, the sweetness of a grape, you know, the you know, color of a sunset, the, all of the things that are not, that it's not just the properties of things, but what our, what our perception, the aspect of it that reaches out into us, those are called qualia. So humans are constantly perceiving qualia. These, these phenomenal, and when we say phenomenal, we don't mean wow. Phenomenal means the phenomena that we, we, we uh, are exposed to. Phenomena means the real world and how it's perceived. Okay? So the phenomena, the phenomenal quality of things, those are the qualia. We perceive those things in all of our perceptual experiences. Everything I see, everything I hear, everything I taste and touch, I'm getting these sense perceptions that I then interpret. But there's no physicalist description of my brain that can account for all of those actualities of perception. Now you can say, you know, I'm touching this and it's stopping me from moving forward and there's a physical sense. But the sense of coolness, okay, where in my brain coolness or hardness or there are lots of those kind of qualia that are that are more than physical in their description. They actually have a uh, a cognitive quality that you can't explain in terms of you know just being a physical body and experiencing it. Does that make sense? There, there are, it's almost as though we're saying there are value judgments about all the things that we we experience. You know, uh, oh that that red apple looks great. Okay, that's that's more than just a physical thing going on. I'm I'm taking in, perceiving, and evaluating my perceptions about things all the time. And that's the qualia. And we can't explain how, if we're only physical bodies, how that could be the case, this sort of evaluative experience of sensual, experience, of sensual activities, okay? The third argument is the argument from intentionality, the idea that mental states often refer to things outside themselves that don't involve any kind of physical relationships. We can think about stuff in meaningful ways. I can remember my mother, who died a number of years ago, and what she was like and her characteristics, and I can take, I can have feelings about that. How is that a physical process? How can that be determined to be purely a physical activity? There's something else going on there, the mental state. When I think about things that are not me, and not something that's right in front of me, not a physical something I can touch or see or experience right now, but again, it's kind of an abstract, memories, projections. I can imagine what it would be like to go to the moon. Now, what possible physical explanation can I give for how that, that thinking process would occur? It seems to be completely outside any physicality when we talk about thinking about, about things that no physical object is involved, all right? So, some of the, those are some of the arguments for mind-body dualism. Now, in addition to that, we obviously, as Christians, take very seriously Scripture, which, which makes it clear to us, you know, that Scripture talks about the fact that, you know, our bodies will die, but we will continue. That some part of us, mind, spirit, you can call it whatever you want to, well, I've been using mind and soul synonymously, that something will continue. And so we have a biblical, theological stance on that. But philosophy, we're talking, this is a philosophy class. In fact, that should have been the way I responded to John's question before about the Holy Spirit when we were talking about how we make moral decisions. Yes, we believe the Holy Spirit is in us and it guides us and it directs us, but this is a philosophy class, right? It's philosophical theology, but I said from the outset that we were going to be focusing more on the philosophy side because it's an introduction. So we need to 
if philosophical theology involves then beginning to do theological assessments of the philosophy. And this is a basic introduction class. So um, I, I think the right answer to John is absolutely we believe that. And I agree with that. And I've taught that. But from a philosophical point of view, we're dealing with other ways to perceive it. And it's valuable for us to do that because then we can communicate with people who don't start with that presumption that the Holy Spirit is real within us. So we're talking about other ways we can understand and argue about, you know, argue meaning not a negative, but rather make statements for why we believe that the body and our mind or soul, the other, the non-physical part of us, both are real. So, um, but criticisms of this in, involve, uh, for instance, what's called uh, causal overdetermination. If we have a body and if we have a mind or soul, however you want to perceive that, Obviously, those two things are interacting. Uh, there are some practical ways that we, we can experience physical symptoms if our mind is in the wrong place, okay? Um, and things that happen to our body can affect our mind. Things that happen to our mind can affect our bodies. Obviously, there's crossover going on there. They're both parts of us. But what is the nature of that interaction? When we talk about our experience of things, um, you know, I see a beautiful red apple, and I take it and I eat it, and I taste the sweetness, you know, and, and it goes into my system and my body breaks it down and it uses the nutrients for that and everything. Well, my mind was involved in seeing it and liking it, wanting it, and getting it, you know, deciding I'm going to do this. But what's the actual causal connection? How do those two things interact? We don't know. We don't know how it is. We don't know the particular mechanism by which our mind and our body connect with each other. We can say we have both, but we have no explanation for how that's true. So that's one argument against the mind-body dualism. And they call it casual overdetermination because why, you know, never use a big word when a diminutive one will do, as we used to say. Uh, it basically, casual, uh, causal overdetermination means you're projecting something far beyond what you really have reason for, according to people who argue against this. A second argument against mind uh, mind the mind dualism approach, is what's called the interaction problem. If the soul, and it's related, these two are related, if the soul is separate from, and yet, as we just said, caused, causally interacts with our body, you know, the two things are working together to make decisions, to go places, to, you know, to whatever, that would suggest that the soul or mind in some way is exerting energy. All right? It's doing something, and doing something implies there is some energy behind it. Well, we know where the energy for our body comes from. It comes from the fuel of what we eat. Where does the energy from our soul come from? Again, this is, these are people who are arguing against this. The suggestion, the second law of thermodynamics, which is one of the law of the conservation of energy and matter, um, says that energy cannot be either created or destroyed. It can only be moved around. You know, there's a constant quanta of energy that exists in the world. Well, if our if we if we can't say how is our soul powered, then does it have its own energy source? It is, is it creating energy? And so the argument is that doesn't fit with all we know about the way energy works. And so there's an argument there. Now, uh, I would say, <laughs> I think my argument against that, because this chapter more than any other, and I do it a lot, I'm going through and I'm making notes, you know, and saying, wait a minute. The idea that the mind and the body are both entities that exist in us, the very fact they're interconnected, means that our mind may very well be powered by our body without that necessarily saying there's only one thing. Right? It's possible to have two things, one of which is providing the energy or, or uh, for another without them being the same thing. So that's my, I believe that's how that fits. Um, so, but this, this is the mind-body dualism, and this is the Christian idea, because Scripture is very clear that we have an interior and an exterior self, and the interior self will last forever. The exterior self will die. That's a fundamental part of our beliefs. And so, as Christians, we accept mind-body dualism. The other way of viewing this is physicalism. Um, and physicalism basically says, as materialists, that it's only a body. That's all we have. There is no sense. There is nothing separate from that. That it's just something else that's an aspect of it. There's a couple of ways to, to view this. I don't want to go through them. Philosophical behaviorism is one of them. 
that insist that we're only physical beings, but the functions and qualities that we normally associate with mind, or that we say are actions of the mind, are in fact just behaviors or tendencies to behave. Our body does certain things, and we say, I'm thinking about that, when in fact it's a purely physical process. The extreme version of this, the sort of hard deterministic version of this, uh, we'll get into hard determinism in a minute, is saying that everything you experience, every thought you have, every feeling you have, every motivation you have, is a chemical event inside your body. If you feel love, then that's certain chemicals in your brain firing in certain ways within the synapses, and you can explain it that way. Of course, that doesn't tell you where it comes from or what causes it, what motivates it, what causes you to feel love. Now, there are no explanations behind it. But the philosophical behaviorism says anything that you, your mind is doing is simply a kind of behavior that your body has. It's not anything separate from your body. It's just an extension of your body. Right? Um, criticisms of philosophical behaviorism. First, some thoughts and feelings and desires are never expressed as behavior. And if, we, if there are some thoughts, feelings, emotions, motivations, desires that never are reflected in any behavioral way, then what, how can we say that they are simply, that our thoughts and minds and feelings and motivations are simply one kind of behavior that our body's going through? You can say, well, it, you know, it's, they're just not externalized. Well, then what is a behavior? You get into definitional problems then. Um, some behaviors even go contrary to feelings. A soldier on the battlefield who is scared to death and self-preservation is his driving force may still have an act of bravery in order to save somebody else. His actions, his behaviors are contrary to what his feelings are. And there's no explanation for that under pure philosophical behaviorism as a kind of uh, physicalism. Behavior is not always consistent with what we think or feel, so how can what we think or feel just be a kind of behavior? Um, some kind of thoughts, like abstract thoughts. There's no way they can be expressed in behavior. I'm thinking of an infinite digression of negative numbers. Is that a behavior of some kind? And yet if I'm thinking of it, a, a philosophical behaviorist would say it is. Now, another thing that is an argument against philosophical behaviorism is that it denies the subjective, that is the interior and hidden first-person aspects of the mind that go beyond behavior. Again, I can sit quietly with my eyes closed and my mind can go all manner of places and do all manner of things with no behavioral expression given. That subjectivity, that I-ness, that my mind has the ability to start with and then work with, that's not behavioral. And, and again, they would say, well, somewhere down deep inside, if we could just see it, something chemical is going on, some synapses are firing, some activities in your body are leading to that. And yet they can't prove that. There's no evidence for it. They're just surmising that. Because they start with the presumption there can't be a mind that is not concrete or a soul that is not concrete. And then they can propose whatever they want to to try to defend that, but there's no evidence for it. And I think there is a, a common sense kind of perception that that's not true. Things can and do go on in my mind that are not connected to my body. Another approach to physicalism is called the strict identity theory. This suggests that mental states are synonymous with brain states. This is kind of a more focused version of what I was saying earlier about you know things that happen in your brain. Um, that sensations, beliefs, awareness are nothing more than chemical events and processes within the brain. The other kind of implies that, saying that it's behavioral. There must be something physical going on. This specifically relates to the brain and says that the mind and the brain are the same thing. Okay. Um, criticisms of this are mental states cannot be directly equated to concrete events, location, shapes, or other physical criteria. Now, you've all seen the TV shows or the documentaries or whatever where they say if we stimulate a certain part of, you know, they'll use electrodes and stimulate a certain part of the brain and it, it, it reactivates memories or it causes them to speak in you know, a different language. Did you read the thing recently? There was a fellow who was in a coma. He was Australian. He was in a coma. When he woke up, he was fluent in Mandarin. <laughs> now, he had taken a beginning Mandarin course in college. 
But when he woke up, from, but he did not speak Mandarin. When he woke up from this coma, and it was a, you know, he had a problem with his brain that caused him to be in the coma, he, would not, he was so fluent in Mandarin, he now makes his living as a Mandarin translator. And Mandarin speakers say he has the most perfect accent of any non-Mandarin you know, non person they've ever met. The brain is weird, okay? We don't understand all of that stuff. But, despite all of that, despite the fact that they can say, well, we stimulate this part of the brain and a certain thing happens, it is not true that there is consistently, even in the majority of cases, one physical location of the brain that is responsible for things. Most often, there are multiple parts of the brain that are involved in the processing of thoughts, uh, or the recollection of memories, or the learning of a skill. It's not locally isolated. And in fact, there are many things that human beings do, mental processes, that we can't identify anything that's going on in the brain that necessarily connects to that. So as I said earlier, there is not hard evidence. There are some things that kind of suggest it, but most people take that sort of very loose suggestion and extrapolate it to say, oh, we know exactly you know, what causes people to be alive in the brain. We don't. Um, so no hard evidence to support all uh, activity, mental activity, such as subjective awareness, perception of quality, and intentionality. None of those are things that we can identify where in the brain those things happen. Um, now there is a there is a, a group of an offshoot of strict identity theorists called eliminativist. Call themselves, you know, squirrely guys. I don't the names they come up with. Eliminativist. They insist that the only problem is science hasn't found all the answers yet, but that they will. Okay? It's funny to me that, what, that people who follow scientism, the belief that science is the only way to real truth or understanding, are, are astonishingly quick to say, well, we don't have the answers yet, but we will. Man, is that an act of faith. Is that not a, a statement of faith? <laughs> Charles Darwin said that, no, we don't have sufficient false fossil evidence, for instance, to prove direct evolution by natural selection from lower forms of animals to humans. But he said, we will. He said, within a generation, I expect we'll find all the fossils we need to prove it. We never have. Ever. There's only one fossil that's ever been identified as being possibly demonstrative of a move from one animal species to another. And that is one fossil that appears to have both the characteristics of lizards and of birds. And it is seriously questioned as whether or not it's authentic. Because the guy that found it sold it for a lot of money, and and it's believed it may be fake, and, and then people there's a very strong, you know, um, disagreement on that. But I think we need to recognize that some of the people who maintain these scientific ideas to the when I say scientism, remember scientism is the belief that science is the only source of truth, and that there is nothing other than than empirical the things that can be proven by empirical evidence. Those who maintain that, it's astonishing if you pay attention and think about it, how often they make huge leaps of faith. Like the empiricists saying, oh, well, this is still valid because we should have found those things yet. But we will. Okay, call me when you get it. And we will rethink this. I'm, I don't, I'm being a little snippy today, sorry. <laughs> um, Another version of physicalism is functionalism. And that says don't focus so much on what the brain is, whether it's connected to the you know, mind or is the mind, or you know, whether it's, but focus on what it does. In other words, the best way to understand that is to think of the brain like a computer. And it does certain things. You don't have to know all the details of how it's wired or how the programming was done or all of that, but you can be aware of the things it can do. So think of the brain that way. Uh, functionalism, as you might think, it talks about what is the function, what does it do? It looks at the brain as the human mind, which they believe is the brain, that the human mind is just an expression of a very sophisticated computing device. And those who are strict fun functionalists say that eventually artificial intelligence will proceed to the point where it will be able to demonstrate not just computing capabilities, processing capabilities, but will demonstrate beliefs, intentions, and even self-awareness. That's the source of all the, you know, the scary movies about the future. You know, Terminator is when Skynet becomes self-aware and decides the real problems, all those people, let's get rid of them and everything will be fine. 
or this idea of there have been all kinds of uh, Will you know um, Will Smith had a movie about robots that become self-aware and and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. This idea that at some point computer devices will develop an artificial intelligence to the extent that they actually have all of the 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 what we think of as human characteristics, like self-awareness or sentience, um, beliefs, intentions. They will be motivated by desires for things, not just to resolve the program. Some people believe this so strongly that they believe, and, and, and um, uh, Dennett is quoted in the book. Dennett is one of the new atheists, by the way. They don't say that in the book. Um, Daniel Dennett, along with Christopher Hitchens, who died two years ago, um, and Dawkins, um, Dennett is one of the new atheists, and one of his beliefs is that we are just the most sophisticated computer imaginable and nothing else, and the time will come when we'll be able to download our consciousness into a machine and therefore live forever. Some people believe this so much, I can't remember his name, Khan? It starts with a K. A really advanced scientist, he's an inventor, he's invented all this stuff. He loved his father, has never gotten over the loss of his father. And so his life project now, in between inventing new vacuum cleaners and stuff that made him very, very, very wealthy, is he is collecting every recollection that anyone has of his father. Every piece of material, and this involves trying to recover letters he's written and clothing that he wore. He's got a small warehouse full of this stuff because he believes at some point that the accumulation of all this information, all of this physical you know, trappings of his father's life, will allow him to program a computer that will basically be his father. Now, other people say, how sad. He can't, really, he let, can't let go of his father, and so he's hoping to resurrect him someday in the form of a computer member. Um, so, there are people who are very serious about this. Criticisms of functionalism, the idea that the brain and the mind, therefore, is simply a, a very, very advanced computer system, and so therefore it is in the same way, see, the example here, a computer can talk to you. It can answer questions. You know, we have levels already of artificial intelligence. Now, that's weak artificial intelligence. Somebody who says that artificial intelligence will actually become self-aware, those are called strong AI believers, artificial intelligence. But, he, but weak artificial intelligence believers are the ones that say, you know, I can create a machine that will answer your questions, perhaps projects a, a holographic image that you can interact with, but still all that's going on is a computational kind of background, right? Um, the strong AI believers think someday it truly will become self-aware. You know, they're not nearly as frightened of that as they should be if they think it's true. Critics insist that the reduction of all mental states to causal or computational computational operations within the brain doesn't adequately account for the qualitative facts of human mental life. Remember, if you don't know this, you'll learn it for the first time, everything a computer does is broken down into binary. It's either zeros or ones. Everything, no matter how complicated the computer is. Um, and somebody once said that the difference in humans and computers is that computers are really dumb really fast and people are really smart, really slow. <laughs> Meaning we have capabilities that computers don't, but it takes us a while to get there. A computer, as it processes binary digital information, can do so enormously rapidly, but unless you're a strong AI believer, there is a point beyond which computers cannot process. They are limited to you know, what they've been given. They can't create new, supposedly. So, I mean, I can remember, I can remember when they used to say no computer could ever defeat a grandmaster in chess. Well, it happens all the time now. So, yes, they're getting better at it. But at what point? The, the criticism is that perceptions and evaluation of, again, qualia, that's why that's an important word, things like colors, not just perceiving, because the sensors, you can put sensors on a computer that will be able to perceive the difference in green and red, but to be able to evaluate them. Can a computer have a favorite color, for instance? Flavors, smells, tastes. Those who are critics of func functionalism say that those kinds of aspects of not only perceiving but evaluating qualia are not within the abilities of any computational system that is not 
self-aware and human. Peter Searle, or not Peter Searle, uh, I knew a Peter Searle, <laughs> worked for World Vision. Um, I can't remember his first name right now. But Searle is somebody who proposes a kind of functionalism, but he presented the example of the Chinese, um, the Chinese symbols. Do you remember reading that? Somebody is locked in a room, and they're given a guide, a set of instructions that says, if you see these, if somebody hands you these Chinese characters, you respond with these Chinese characters. And the person does that. Well, somebody outside the room who does speak Chinese can ask questions and then can get answers and read those answers and understand something. So information is being communicated. But the person who's actually doing the getting and handing out, they don't read Chinese. They have no clue what's being said to them or what they're saying back. All they're doing is following a set of instructions that is wrote. Well, Searle argues that that's all that computers can do, that they can do it more quickly, and they can, you know, we're getting better and better all the time in terms of the subtlety of their ability to do that. But that fundamentally, the ability to take in requests, look at a set of instructions, and then feed out rote answers, even if it's very subtle and very fast, does not constitute the same thing as self-awareness. Okay? And so he makes that argument. So those are the two aspects of what we think human beings are. What makes us human? Now again, as Christians, we would insist that there's an aspect of us having a soul. You know, a soul that will, once we are created, live forever. But when we talk about philosophy, part of our goal here is to be able to interact in an intelligent, intellectual way with people who don't start with the theological premises we do. And so that's why we deal with some of these issues. Okay, let's talk for a minute about personal identity. We talked about what makes us human. Well, what makes us individually human? What makes one person distinct from all other persons? What constitutes personal identity? And what happens if a person significantly changes? Are they still the same person? They use the example uh, in the book of the movie regarding Henry with Harrison Ford, who is injured, he's shot, and he seemed like a completely different person. His personality has changed radically. Is he or is he not still the same person? I've mentioned a couple of times the television show Carolyn and I watch called Perception. And um, it, it stars, oh, what's his name? Um, starts with a name. He's one of the guys that started Will and Grace. You know, not, not uh, Jack, it was the other one. And in this, he's a, um, a doctor, a brain specialist who teaches at a university on matters of the brain, but then he's also a consultant with the FBI helping them solve cases because of his understanding of the way people think, the way their minds work, etc. The unusual part about him is he is uh, paranoid schizophrenic and he has visions. And one of the ways he helps solve cases is because when he, when he has a hallucination and he's talking to people, sometimes what those people say to him give him hints and clues as to what's really going on that he had not consciously perceived. So, very interesting show I think. They actually had an episode where there was a guy, a character, he was a biker, and he, um, he had tortured and killed this young woman. Well, in the process of being arrested, they actually had this on, on video because uh, he, you know, they tackled him in front of a police car, that video. They tackled him and they threw him on the hood of the car. Well, he had a gun, and he's gonna shoot him. Well, when they threw him on the car, he ended up shooting himself in the head. It's not, you don't see blood or anything like that, it's not gross. Well, once he, he recovers, but once he recovers, he is the sweetest, most gentlest. Guards who had known him in prison before and said he was the most unruly, impossible, you know, aggressive, dangerous guy they'd ever met, say so he's a perfect prisoner. He's polite. He asks us how we're doing, asks us how our kids are. People who, you know, everybody who had known him said this is not the same person. Now, he remembered his past, and he felt sorry for what he'd done in the past. He apologized to the family of the girl he killed. He did not try to say he didn't do it. Um, and in fact, some of the family members, at least initially, say, he's not the same guy, we don't think we can punish him. And so the question comes up, that the psychologist, who is not a believer, he's very much a materialist, he's a physicalist, okay, I think, he examines the guy's brain and sees where the bullet went in, and then exam interviews him and talks to everybody who knew him, and he says, this is not the same person as the one who committed those crimes. And so can you punish him for those crimes when that person isn't here anymore? Now, obviously, what I just said raises the question of what does it mean to be a person? That's the same premise of the regarding Henry, but I hadn't seen that movie. I did see the show. 
is a changed person, we're talking significantly changed, still the same person if he retains the continuity of his memories. Some people say that. And this is the place that it gets, I think it gets kind of unuseful in terms of how it presents in the book. Is he the same person if he has the same body and the same relevant physical characteristics? People who believe this are motivated by a purely materialistic worldview because his physical body is all, all that he has. There is nothing else. Okay. Is he the same person if he has the same brain? Not like we can change it out, but some people who would say that the brain is the center of what it means to be human would say, got the same brain, he has to be the same person. Is he the same person if he has the same soul? And if so, how do we understand that? We believe that people when they're born, they're born, we as Christians believe they're born with a body and, and they are the breath of God comes into them, the breath of the Holy Spirit, and we are made, made both physical and spiritual beings. Well, if the soul, and, and this raises the, the resurrection question, because after all, when we die, our bodies are gone, and something continues. So, if we believe in resurrection, then we'd have to say, if we think we continue, but our body's gone, then we can't believe that it's based upon whether we have a body. We can't believe it's a brain, because our brain's not going to be there. That's part of our body. So, you know, what else is it that causes us to be the same person after death as before death? And the book says some absurd things like, well, you know, if somebody got blown up, then it'd be impossible even for God to put it back together. Excuse me, but didn't God put them together in the first place from what, what amounts to almost nothing? I mean, from, you know, an egg and, a, you know, a sperm and everything starts from, you know, God can... So that part of the book seemed to be quite absurd in the way they thought it out. Um, or perhaps related to soul, which I believe is true, perhaps a person is the same if they have the same character as reflected by their motivations. There's a part of me, and I believe that's consistent because remember, when we become a Christian, it says the old things have gone away. All things are new. You are a new creature, a new creation. So are we not, to that extent, a different person? God's grace takes away our responsibility for all the things we did before, as we are forgiven for our sins. Now, the, the penal system may not. We may still have to sleep in bed, you know, be made. Um, but there is some extent to which we, if we believe we become new creatures in Christ, then we do become new creatures. We are a different person. And one of the things to me, and some of those arguments about, you know, from regarding Henry and from the TV show Perception, a person is the same person if they have the same character as reflected by their motivations. If they have a completely different character, if they have a completely different set of motivations, I no longer am driven to commit violence just to prove I can. You know, power, greed, those things don't, don't drive me. Are those not the same comparisons we're making when somebody becomes a Christian? Our character has changed because our motivations have changed. And while we may in one way say we're the same person, in another way it's very biblical to say we are a different person. And so those questions come into it. There's no simple answer to that. Those are simply the aspects that I think it's worthwhile for us to think about. Is that fair? Questions about that? Got ten more minutes. I want to deal with the nature of free will for a few minutes. And then onward and upward. <laughs> further up and further in, as Lewis says in the last battle. The aspect of human nature, do we have free will? Now this again goes back to, to other questions about the nature of reality. The question is, are we free agents? Meaning, do we have free choice? Are we able to make our own choices, do good or bad, to act or refrain from acting as we wish? And so, if that's true, we can legitimately be held morally responsible. Now, some people say no. You may think that's an obvious one. But pure materialists, many of them, probably most of them, are also determinists. They say all that is real, again, we're talking metaphysics here as the foundation of this, all that is real is the, is the material world and the laws that control that material world. We often leave that part off. That there are natural laws that direct the way the physical material world acts, and those are unchangeable. Well, somebody who believes that that's true, materialism, and that there are natural laws that are unchangeable that direct everything, 
if we are only physical beings, that's all we are, and we are subject to that, and those are called determinists, somebody who believes that everything is predetermined by the natural laws, unchangeable natural laws that run the material universe, a determinist would say you ultimately are simply doing what you are. You're acting out what you are. In the same way of saying we can't make a moral judgment about a cat who chases and kills a mouse because that's what cats do. There's no moral evaluation. You may say, well, I wish I hadn't done that. You know, we, we have, like three or four times a year, we have uh, a nest of uh, cliff swallows, a nest of swallows on our patio, our terrace. And these birds keep coming back, and they have, like I say, three or four um, broods, what do you call them? Babies, sets of babies, and there's usually three or four or five even. Well, one of them one day, just as we were learning to fly, fluttered down, you know, I didn't see how he got there, but he got on the floor and got in the hallway because the, we usually leave the door open, and Slick got it. Mm -hmm. Now, I think Slick was upset about it afterwards because, I mean, he just went after this moving thing, and then he backed off and he was like, what, you know? I couldn't be mad at him as though he had done a moral wrong because he's a dog and he's a hunter, you know? But Sinjis are hunters, they have a very strong hunting drive. <coughs> so while I was very sad he did that, and I wish he hadn't, I couldn't say he had done something morally wrong. Well, somebody who believes in pure determinism as a version of materialistic view would say that whatever human beings do, we do it because that's part of our nature. If we are driven by natural laws, and therefore, ultimately, we can't be held morally responsible. You begin to see a problem with that. But we have to ask, what is the relationship between human freedom, the ability to make our own choices, and determinism, this idea that everything is run by a natural law that is unchangeable, just like Slick is a, is a dog whose nature is to hunt. And I can't be mad at him if he jumps on a, a bird that's in the hallway. So the idea is the materialist, determinism is the materialistic idea that all things must act according to unchangeable natural laws. That's what determinism is. It's a, a version, an offshoot, if you will, of materialism. There are two ways of, of understanding this relationship between human freedom and determinism. The first one is called compatibilism. Compatibilism means that the, the people who maintain this say that human freedom and determinism are logically consistent that you can both have human freedom and also be required to act within the natural laws that drive you as a physical creature. Now for that reason, because it, they depend upon natural laws being unchangeably irrevocable, even though they maintain human freedom, compatibilists would say, you know, they, they believe in natural law, not supernatural. Then incompatibilism says that human freedom and responsibility are not compatible with determinism. That we have free choice apart from any natural law that forces us to act in a certain way. So let's talk about those two. Let's talk about incompatibilism first. We'll be done in just a few minutes. Incompatibilism, remember, it says that the determinism, the fact that we are controlled by natural laws that we can't change or do anything about, and human choice are not compatible. It has to be one or the other. Either we're free or we're under determinism. It can't be both. That's incompatibilism. Hard determinism is the extreme version of uh, incompatibilism, which says, it's basically reflected in what's called the consequent argument. Our acts are the consequences of the laws of nature and of the past, everything that's led up till now. And if that being true, we are free. We can't make free choices. It is our nature, which is part of natural law, and it is what has happened before, that forces us to be how we are and do what we do. And so therefore, we technically can't be morally held responsible. Now society may say, well, you know, Lynn isn't morally responsible for having killed 19 people, but we need to do something to keep her from doing it again. So it's not your fault, but I'm sorry. You know, you gotta go. That doesn't mean that they completely reject any idea of penal responsibility, but they don't believe it's a moral issue, okay? Now, the other kind of incompatibilism is exactly the opposite. It answers the question in an opposite way. So hard determinism says the driving force is, the, it's, these two things are incompatible, determinism and free choice. But hard determinism says determinism wins out, there is no such thing as free choice, really. The other side of it says these two things aren't compatible because determinism isn't real, and we do have a free choice, and that's called libertarianism, not political libertarianism. Okay, we're talking about that. This is philosophical libertarianism. 
The idea that humans have the power of, con the way they define it is, we have the power of contrary choice, choice or the ability to do otherwise. We can choose yes or no, right or wrong, good or bad, left or right. And that, that is necessary as, as a component of moral responsibility. If I don't have the freedom to decide yes or no, if I only have one choice according to determinism, I can't go off that, then I can't be held. Libertarians would agree that I can't be held morally responsible. They say no, determinism can't be right because we do have to be held morally responsible. And in fact, there is something in us that says you decide what's right and wrong. You decide how you're going to act, and you're going to have to be held accountable for that. This is consistent with Orthodox Christianity. So Orthodox Christianity is, for the most part, a reflection of the libertarian view of incompatibilism of the human free will. Okay? Because we say, you're not forced to do this. We're not forced to kill those people. You decided to. And you have to be held accountable for that. Right? Sound familiar? Now. This is one of the places where I feel like the book really missed an important point. They say that the biggest argument against libertarianism is what's called the libertarian dilemma. And I say it's a false argument. This is my, I'm giving you my philosophical input here. The argument is that a person's actions either must be determined, determinism, natural law, or else they happen by a chance occurrence of factors. They give the example of somebody who has a choice of job A or job B and they choose job A. They say, well, Everything that has occurred in that person's life, their education, their, you know, their previous training, their preference for location to live, and everything else, the combination of all those things is just purely chance. And so therefore, if it's not determination, it must be chance. But whether it's deter determinism or whether it's chance, either way that person isn't really in control. They don't really have free choice, right? No. <laughs> My point is, this is a false dichotomy because it fails to realize that factors may exist that influence a person's actions without requiring them. Not determination and not just chance. You know, I can say, if, I'm cho if I choose job A or job B, it's based upon my past experience, where the job is in the country, you know, the fact that I want to be paid US dollars and not in the yen, um, the, you know, any number of things. But the argument that that's purely a matter of chance is wrong, and by saying it's purely a matter of chance, so therefore I don't really have a choice, I believe, and would argue, that those things may influence me, but they do not require me to make a choice. All of those factors may get weighed in the process, but I can say, you know, for instance, I could say, Boy, that job really looks good, but something in my gut tells me I want to take that job instead. Is that not true? I mean, I've done that, quite literally. And so it's not pure determinism, and it's not a matter of pure chance. I still, ultimately, at the end of the day, have a choice. I may be influenced by various factors, but those are not chance. All right? The book misses that. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think we need to recognize that we can be influenced without being required. Is the point there. And one last slide. On compatibilism. Let's talk about compatibilism now. We've talked about inco incompatibilism. Uh, compatibilism insists that human actions can be determined in some ways without this constituting a threat to human freedom and moral responsibility. I should say, I said earlier that most Christians fall into the incompatibilist libertarian view. This actually, compatibilism, is probably more the strict Calvinist view. That there is a determination, which means God's will has predetermined what's going to happen. That's what predestination is all about, or preordination. And yet, in some way, I still have free choice. Now again, if you spend time with this section in the book, you will, you know, you will end up wanting to shoot yourself. Uh, because it's very complicated. But the bottom line, I believe, the way I would describe it, is when we speak of free will, all we mean is that a person is able to do what he wants to do, he or she, and that what the person does, as long as it's not coerced or constrained, is what they wanted to do. Now, the, and here's the point. Freedom is the ability to act according to one's own desires and intentions. This can be compatible with determinism, as our choices can occur within the parameters of natural law. So we're still morally responsible for our actions. In other words, 
strict Calvinist, and I don't consider myself a strict Calvinist because I'm always ready to say, you know, I'm not too sure about some of that. Um, I think it's a better solution, but to say God has predetermined His will for me, preordained, predestined, predetermined, but within that predetermination of God, as I move forward and I come to a decision point, I still have the free choice to say yes or no, right or wrong, good or, or ill. It is within the overall preordination or predetermination, or in the case of somebody who's not speaking from a theological point of view, from determinism. So determinism is a sort of a bubble that we live in, that we are going along in one direction, but then we, we make the individual decisions that get us in that direction. It's complicated. I mean, I, I can get it, I can see it, but only barely, and that's because I'm just messing with this kind of stuff. Um, so if you don't quite get that, that's okay. But there are those, again, some of the arguments they get into on this about, well, you know, what you do is what you wanted to do because you did it. And if you hadn't done it, if you'd done something else, then that's not what you wanted to do. And, and you begin to go, <laughs> okay? Um, and it, it does get very complicated. But the idea is that I believe it is possible, and I believe Cal Calvinism addresses this, that within the idea of a determinist view, in, in the case of Calvinism, God's preordained will, that we still do have choices, but always in the direction and within the context and confines of that predetermined will. All right? It may be that we have a choice to go left here instead of right, but God makes sure we end up in the same place. Nothing is going to happen outside of his predetermination. Marvin? Just to think about from the Bible where God says, if these miracles have been done to such and such people, they would have prevented it. You know, and so he, he knows he everything that could be. And right. he knows how far to push people. In the case of Job, he, despite all kinds of circumstances, Job held his ground. Right. So. Yeah, and again, in systematic theology, we got into all, we got into this topic as well, free will, extensively. And we talked about all the places. In fact, I went through all the many, many verses that says God ordains, God insists, God pre-orders even what we perceive as being acts of evil. And it, uh, there, and it's not two or three verses; it's twenty or thirty. And, and there, you know, you could that I looked at, you could do more. So, you know, there is an argument within Orthodox Christianity, at least from a Calvinist viewpoint, that compatibilism is not in the idea that that there's determination, but that there's also free will. That those things are not contradictory or inconsistent. Okay. Questions? All right. That's our lecture on human nature.